Hello everybody, this is Hugh Waters over here in Gloucestershire and Phil over there in London town. And it's been a little while since we got our last podcast going, so uh, apologies for that. We had Christmas and New Year in the way. So, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, well, we're going to have a quick look, I believe, at some top tips on audio. It's it's one of a series, Phil. Phil is seeing what's going to happen next. Yes, um, so... Uh, you know, obviously, all these sort of like super interesting, you know, kind of color imaging and those sort of things are all, all well and good. But I thought, uh, at least for today, we'd revisit um, a subject which we've already done a couple of podcasts on already. We did Audio 101 and Audio, sort of second audio, um, you know, the engineering side of it. Uh, and so I'd encourage you to go back and have a look at those if you haven't watched those. Uh, yeah, you, you know, if, if kind of audio uh, is still a bit of a mystery to you. But today it's kind of audio tips. So it's kind of, I suppose, we're trying to pull together uh, some of the. Um, uh, years of uh, of having to bodge things and having to uh, make things work and and maybe some of the tips and tricks we've deployed over the years um exactly uh, and then and then we're going to try and do a similar thing for video uh, uh yep. and 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 then um uh i'm still toying it, it should it, power is obviously very important and and you know we've obviously done mains safety 101 in the past and a, yeah. a second mains one but also data as well there's lots of tips and tricks that we employ for 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 making data work and getting us out of the uh, out of trouble, you know, sort of like when you're when you're on the back of an OB truck on a, a windy night and you want to go home, but you've got to get something <laughs> working in time. That's it, and that's the the nature of the, the thing. Uh, in all uh, projects, whether they're planned beautifully or planned on the run, uh, there are times when two things don't quite go together, and uh, so audio is one of those. Um, yes, so let's have a let's have a think about it. Yes. So the thing the thing that's helped me a lot. Um, is um, this little gadget here I've got up on screen. Now, there are several manufacturers who make these little kind of uh, box solutions, you know, Blackmagic, obviously, oh, yes, um, yes. AJA, uh, and, uh, and there's, there's, there's lots of others, aren't there? There's um, Lynx and um, you know, other people. So I've got one here. This is, uh, this is exactly what's up on screen. This is a, a, an HD10, and it comes in two flavours. It comes in, in the one I've got up on screen, which is the same one as I've got here, uh, yeah. plucked out of the box in the workshop. Um, this is an a, a HD10 AMA, uh, and it's a uh, it's a, a de-embedder stroke re-embedder. So you're obviously familiar um, with the concept of of serial digital video, the kind of video that goes down a piece of coaxial cable, uh, mm-hmm. baseband video, uh, and and ever since uh, uh, you know the early '90s when we started dealing with serial digital video, audio has been a feature of that. You can have embedded audio. You know, on a, on a standard definition um, bit of coax, you have four channels of embedded video, and then as we've gone to HD and dual link and 3G and all these sort of extensions to the HDSDI standard, uh, you know, more and more channels of audio are available. Uh, but this little gadget here um, basically will de-embed and present on on the D-type on, on the back of the box. And so, so you can see it's a Oh yeah. Take that breakout cable off so we can better manipulate it. So so uh, what have we got here? We've got uh, HD SDI input and then two looping uh-huh. outputs, which in and of itself is, is very useful. Oh, it's very handy. Often yes. useful to yes. have that second SDI to play with. Uh, 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 and and then uh, coming out of the, uh, the the D type, wired to the Tascam stroke Yamaha standard, you've got um, uh, the analog audio that was that was coming in on the on on the digital video, and in fact, uh, Just because like, you, the, the yeah. Tascam uh, stroke Yamaha stand didn't realise there was one. Yeah, okay, so it's a bit it's a bit more in depth than that. So <laughs> okay. Tascam was the original, um, uh, uh, you know, audio on a D twenty five standard. So if I, right. if I if I if I look for um, uh, DA eighty eight D twenty five pins, um, uh, that will. Uh, that will that that will you know first hit and there's a PDF and that tells us exactly how a DA88 that original uh, ah, eight channel yes, um, yes. digital audio recorder based on a, a, an eight millimeter um, uh, essentially videotape transport from the yeah. from the late 80s early 90s how that worked uh, now for analog connectors that's reasonably consistent across the industry but for digital connectors. Um, the standard, although the pins are the same, so channel one, channel two, etc. Obviously, uh, an AES pair carries two channels of audio. Of um, uh, th- there's a variation between Tascam and Yamaha. All the pinouts are exactly the same, but Yamaha they go the opposite direction. So on a Yamaha piece of equipment, like a like a, you know a, a, an O3D audio mixer, for example. Uh, that the ins and the outs are swapped around and they go in the opposite direction. So you, you kind of, if you connect a pin-to-pin cable between a Tascam and a Yamaha gadget, you get audio, but it's all in the wrong order. 
uh, etc. So you just have to be aware of that. But when we're talking about analog audio, uh, like we are with the HD10 AMA, the last A yep. is the clue analog. Uh, then it's the Yamaha Tascam analog standard for the for the pin Which out on the D type. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yes. Um, so, uh, so that's rather good. Uh, yeah, but hey, that there are the embedders are plenty. Uh, you know, and that that in itself is not a particularly sort of compelling reason to to have a little one of these gadgets spare on the workshop shelf or or kind of in your box of useful bits. But it's also a re-embedder. So it de-embeds a group of audio. And when I say group of audio, in SDI terms, that's four channels of audio. You know, think about an original DigiBeta, four channels of audio. Um, yeah. And in fact, oh, there, are some, there are some flippable switches on the back where you can say, actually, I want, I want group two. So I want channels uh, five through eight. Uh, uh, or, you know, uh, um, you know, so, so I'm de-embedding a different set of, uh, of channels. Because um, obviously HDSDI can carry um, eight channels of audio. Uh, so, so, so that's rather nice. I can de-embed four channels of audio, choosing from group one or group two, uh, as they call it uh, in SDI terms. So channels one through four or channels five through eight. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then uh, it's also a re-embedder, which means that the, that the SDI stream that's traveling through this box from the HD, SDI in to the two outputs, I can re-embed selectively any of those channels. Ah, right. So the channels that are coming in, you don't just ditch if you don't want to. You can actually pass those through and add some more to it. Yes. So, so, so look at our breakout loom here, and you will notice, there's the D25 connector that plugs into the cat, <laughs> my poor microphone, um, but you'll notice that we've got a mix of lady and gentleman XLRs. So some of these are outputs, yes. some of these are inputs. So uh, if you just back-to-back, -back, uh, you know, uh, input B to output B, input A to output A, uh, you would just have something that had changed the audio back into analog and re-embedded it. But yeah. now you've got access to those channels. You can do things with them. Um, and in fact, on the, on the back of the uh, box, those, the, the little flippy switches here, you can say whether we are de-embedding all of the audio or, or re-embedding some of it or whatever. But this is super useful. So, for example, there's one job I was doing where um, they had to de-embed their, their four-channel uh, feed from BT, which was a, a, mm -hmm. a, a um, football um, match, uh, and their job was to re-embed their own um, commentary and present and send that back to another broadcast partner uh, uh, with their own commentary mixed with the, the Stadium Atmos on one and two and Stadium Atmos clean on three and four. The feed that was being provided to them by BT was uh, clean Atmos on three and four, so just just the sound of the, of the Stadium uh, microphones and uh, a full mix of the host broadcaster's commentary on one and two. And so by using this box, very easy to de-embed three and four, which we need to make as part of our mix. Um, and then uh, using our local commentators, we mix that with their local microphones and we re-embed that onto one and two. So, and there's just lots of scenarios where you have to shuffle some tracks around because maybe a feed has come in with uh, uh, M&E on one and two and the mix on three and four. Well, you don't want that. So this box is a real lifesaver. Uh, you know, yeah. allows you to... Um, uh, you know, do all those uh, operations very, very easily, very quickly. You can just literally swip, swap, swap XLRs around and swap channels and that kind of thing. Um, uh, I was on a job last summer where we'd run out of audio ties between two OB trucks and we just had to get um, some director's talk back, back to a, a link truck. And the only way you could do it was stick it on one of the spare channels on the audio. So I just, I just used one of these to stick it on channel three ah. of the program feed so they could pluck it off at the other end. So, yeah, very, very useful. Super useful. If I'm, if I'm going on a particular OB where I don't know what's going to be available, I will throw one of these in my bag um, just as a kind of get me out of jail card sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and they do another version of this. So this is the HD10 AMA. They also do an HD10 AM, um, which is right. exactly the same box, except it doesn't present as... Uh, analog audio on the D25 connector. It presents as digital audio, AES. Ah. So you've now got eight channels, eight channels in, eight channels out, because obviously four AES pairs is eight channels of audio. And that is super useful. I've used that in lots of situations where I've had to put a something like a Yamaha O3D or an O1R digital audio mixer into a suite, which has got AES in and out on a 25-way D tape type. But I really, really need both the feed from the matrix, which comes in embedded, and the feed back to the matrix has to go out embedded. It's a fantastic way of just turning a, a digital audio mixer into an SDI mixer. Yeah. So, so, so it's embedding eight channels of audio, de-embedding eight channels of audio for the mixer. You know, so they can they, they can they can do the commentary or whatever against what, whatever's coming in from the matrix, and then they can send it back to the matrix. And it's a it's a it's a superb little problem solver for that. Um, 
very, really very, very, very useful little gadget. Yeah. And and not huge expensive. It says seven hundred and ninety five dollars there. They're about five hundred quid. Which yeah. obviously, if you, if you if you're a you know if, if you're a little um, guy on your own is, is is proper money. But you know if if you to have as an extra thing in the workshop, it's 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 you know it's no trouble at all. So that's that's really? my top tip for a, a, a super useful box to keep about the uh, the AJA. HD10 AMA or AM variants. The next Very thing, good. which I think is, is superbly useful, is a, is a software um, piece, which um, is only on OS10. And it's, I mean, I'm, I, you know, I, I love and hate all three operating systems in equal measure. I, I try and use Windows, <laughs> Linux, and Mac every day. So, so it's a yeah. step because you know, as a broadcast engineer, I need to know these things. Uh, but I have to say, one of the areas where I think OS10 really scores is the way it handles audio. Um, so I've got the the audio devices um, a- application, which is in the utilities folder in OS X. It's called the audio MIDI set audio audio MIDI setup um, application, and it basically okay. allows you to create um, aggregate aggregated and um, uh, multi output devices from your audio devices. So currently at the moment there's not a lot going on on this computer. We've got obviously got a built in microphone in in, mm-hmm. in the computer itself. We've got built in output the little speakers in the laptop. Um, then you can see some aggregated devices for when my laptop is normally sat at my workshop bench where um, you know I've got some speakers and a headset uh, you know so I can you know, different audio devices um, and at the moment I've also got a Yamaha um, a little Yamaha AGO3 audio mixer hanging off my machine which you know is, is my kind of my new podcasting setup which I'm going to talk, <laughs> talk about a little bit later because it's a really cool little gadget um, but to be able to name things correctly to be able to have multiple oh, outputs yes. so I want the same audio to go out of three outputs this is the little utility that does that or if I want to be able to create a, a notional kind of virtual headset um, uh, uh, this is the little gadget that does that I can say okay uh, I want um, uh, you know audio to come from this device and audio to go back out to that device and i want to use that, that as my skype sort of send and receive and i you couldn't do it under windows uh without without a blinking patch panel out, you know external to the computer and, and and all that kind of stuff so i think this is this is a super useful little bit of utility software which much overlooked um uh, you know for managing the audio ins and outs on a, on a mac oh really clever so let's quit that I had no idea that was in there yeah yeah, so is, that, is that part of the macros that something you done? Yeah, no, no, it's, it's, it's 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 in the utilities folder, part of the operating system. Um, you know, it's just jolly good. So the next thing I wanted to show, and in fact, I'm going to drag this PDF over. No, no, no. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to a URL, okay. uh, which is on my blog. So uh, passive low value audio pads. Um, yeah, or analog audio is still a fact of life. Um, you know, we're still doing an awful lot of. Um, analog audio work and uh, uh, how often uh, in, a, in a suite do you look at a piece of equipment and it says you know, you know line output uh, plus four dBs and you think why yeah. why not just comply to the standard there is a standard that it's says done with it. these digital levels equate to these analog levels you know why don't you comply to that standard you know and if and if that sounds outrageous go, go, go and watch one of our go and watch one of our previous podcasts about audio because we bang on an awful lot about it there uh, uh, and, and so I always have in my head uh, a way of making audio pads. And I yeah. used to I used to rely entirely on this little book here. You, you, you've ever seen this one? Oh, the, yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, you, you know, the um, Keith Brindley's uh, Radio and Electronics Engineer's Pocketbook. And you see how kind of tatty this one is held together with a little clip there <laughs> and uh, uh, kind of much um, annotated inside. So let's, let's find a, a very typical page. Look, there's uh, lots of uh, handwritten notes augmenting what's in there. And, and so... He has a very good sort of set of, here's how you make an audio pad, but they're kind of approximate. And, uh, you know, we make a few assumptions when we're making audio pads. We, we, we'd like to think that the source um, device that's driving the line is very high impedance. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing that's receiving the audio is very low impedance, uh, and which is true for most things. Um, uh, well, it is now. It never used to be. In the 70s, there was a sort of a tendency for everything to be sending at 600 ohms, receiving at 600 ohms. It's not the case yep. now. Um, and so... Uh, you know, I would just knock up an approximate pad based on Keith's recommendations with whatever sort of nominal values of resistors I had to hand. 
And when Matt Ward, my, my, one of my colleagues, started working for us, and he is a complete audio head, um, uh, did his degree uh, in Salford, um, the, the very well-respected uh, audio degree there, and has worked for proper big recording studios, uh, you know, Metropolis and, and Air Studios and places like that. He said, no, 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 let's just do it properly. You know, it's not hard, uh, you know, and, and uh, he, he did me a little Excel um, uh, kind of pad calculator, and, uh, and, and here's the sort of screen grab of it. And uh, every time I make a pad based on Matt's uh, pad calculator, it comes out within a tenth of a dB. And, and the little adjustment I have to do on the trim pot is like I, I kind of I stare at it and it comes right, you know. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and so that's a very nice way of doing it. And it's, it's, you know, it's just a, an H network. And so, and so you get the values right. You can, you can wire that into the body of an XLR connector. Let me just grab an XLR connector out of, my, uh, out of the XLR bin. So I'm, I'm sitting in the workshop next to all the parts bins. Let's just bust that open and illustrate. You can see that the the back of uh, an XLR connector, where the where, where the the cable goes in, uh, yeah. that's quite soft material, and it's it's actually super easy to uh, build this little pad into the connector and and just present a little trim pot, you know, next to the cable as it comes out. And we've done that on a few jobs; it works really nicely. It means that we can get it right at install time, and hopefully the customer never even notices. Um, so so that's that's my next top tip. Uh, calculating audio pads correctly, and uh, I'm, I'm going to put this PDF, which is all the sort of the things we're talking about today, um, on the Engineers Bench website, so that you can download down, download that um, should you want to. Yeah. So, why my, I don't know why my why my website isn't working properly in this respect. So um, uh, that's that's that one. Um, the next one, this is this is kind of one of my favourite things for asking people is. Why did 1970s uh, rock and roll singers tape two microphones together? Uh, if, you, if, if, like me, you're a big fan of, of kind of 70s rock and roll, and I love the Friday <laughs> night uh, BBC4 rockumentary for that reason. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll often see uh, so, 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 you know, sort of pictures like this where there are two microphones uh, taped together on the singer's mic stand you know, and two cables coming away from it. I just think, well, why on earth do they do that? And of course, it's very obvious. It's common mode, isn't it? Um, yeah. Essentially, the singer is only really singing into one microphone, but both microphones are picking up the noise of the stage. Both microphones are picking up all the ambient noise. And so uh, at the mixing desk end, you would put one channel into phase reverse and yeah. you would just add them together. You just fade them up an equal amount. And, uh, and so now you've got a very nice uh, noise cancelling rig. Uh, and uh, and that's you know whenever people talk to you about noise cancelling in phones and things like that, that's exactly how they work. There are two microphones, one of which gets the voice, one of which almost gets no voice, but both of which get all the ambient noise. And uh, you know address it nowadays because you don't see it much anymore. You know obviously compressors are much better than they ever used to be, uh, and parametric EQ is now fantastic. So being able to pull out the things that are offending you from the from the sound of the stage. Is, is an awful lot easier um, but uh, 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 you know back in the 70s that was the way you did it you had two very very similar sort of specified mics probably sure sm58 which is the classic rock and roll Almost microphone <laughs> I, you know, I own a few of those myself and uh, and and and, uh, and 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 that 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 works brilliantly um, and it's, it's there as a tip because if you're stuck you haven't got the compressor or whatever you need it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a little technique that is easily forgotten, but easily remembered and easily tried out. So. Yes, and and uh, you know, there's there's undoubtedly situations where you have to. And what up. do you do if your desk doesn't happen to have a phase reversal? I suppose you could just open your XLR and just turn two wires over. Absolutely. Well, at the BBC, uh, the standard was uh, yellow audio cables, be they patch cords or XLRs, yes. were in that that indicated they were phase reversing cables. Yeah. So, so the, you just you pop them into the patch panel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we used to do that. <laughs> and of course, this makes no sense in an AES world, but <laughs> our ears are still analog and microphones are still analog. And, yeah. uh, you, you know, there's a, obviously, obviously the digital pad, that beautiful analog sound from one end to the other. That's how I like to try and sell it to people. You know, yeah. we have to look after this gorgeous analog signal. And it's the digital path that does that. Because um, I don't, I, I don't hold a lot of sway with with people who bang on about how audio has to be analog. You know, and vinyl is fantastic and all this sort of stuff. Similarly, you know, I've I've, I've been in I've been in meetings where salesmen have said, I ah, know digital is so much better than analog. Uh, we used to we used to sell um, a brand of loudspeaker which had came in two variants. One was just the regular yeah. loudspeaker, and they, they were nice, five hundred pound sort of like edit suite type loudspeakers with um, uh, XLR inputs. 
and the company brought out uh, a variant on, on one model which had AES inputs and the sales guys loved it because it was like 100 quid more and, <laughs> and, and they were rubbish because it was a, it was a it was a 16 bit converter which didn't sound particularly good and I always say to myself I said look look just rely on the quality of the converter in your editing workstation that's so much better yeah. than the than the sort of like 5 pound chip that's in the back of that loudspeaker um, yeah people don't kind yes, of realize I don't quite understand why they do it that I've been working with some stuff and it seems overly complicated what was wrong with perfectly you know, sensible analog input speakers we've done all the hard work in you know the digitization, the the manipulation, the, you know, the turning it back again to analog. Why why mess it all up at the speaker point? I suppose. <laughs> but it's digital, which is so much better. It's digital, it's much better. How could you not see that, Hugh? Yes. <laughs> so the next thing was, when is it appropriate to bodge unbalance an audio signal? And when I say ah. bodge unbalance an audio signal, I don't mean. So, so, so here's a photo, it's a particularly low-res camera photo, um, of the inside of a wall box. So that's the faceplate of the wall box taken off, and uh, you can see what's going on behind. So there are some XLR um, uh, yes. male connectors, because it's an incoming tie line from the machine room. And there's some uh, uh, audio rep coils, and there's some phonos. So, so essentially the incoming tie line within the wall box has been turned into an unbalanced signal and is presented on, on RCA phono connectors. Uh, you know. And in fact... Uh, uh, I, I went back through the, the boxo bits, and here it is. Look, there's the uh, th th there are the uh, RCA jacks, and, and and there are the the rep coils. What are these? Are these ah, are these Souters? No, they are uh, AP. I don't remember that brand. But anyway, uh, you know these are one to one audio rep coils. Uh, you know, um, uh, and, and 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 these are what we use. You know, if we're sort of like making proper unbalanced um, uh, signals. Uh, proper audio people say no, no, you can't, you can't do that because, you know, transformers don't have a linear response. Blah blah blah. But anyway, it goes on an awful lot, you know. And good quality yeah, yeah. equipment will often have transformer um, output stages to drive the line. Uh, so I'm not talking about the proper way you balance and unbalance audio signals. And if if balanced and unbalanced audio signals is anathema to you, you don't really know what that's all about. Please go and look at our audio 101 podcast from a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, but there are many occasions when. Uh, people will want to unbalance a signal just by taking the ground of the balanced signal and the, the hot. Uh, and yeah. obviously you only get half the signal level there. You've lost half the signal level, 6 dBs down. That might not matter if you're feeding it into a DVD recorder or something, uh, but people will do that. But the standard it, over uh, years gone by was to take uh, the earth and the cold part of the signal, tie them mm -hmm. together in, in the RCA connector, in, in the unbalanced connector, and you get the full range of signal... Uh, but you've now unbalanced it. You've forced unbalanced it. So what does that do? Well, if, it, if it's a high-quality piece of equipment, like an old-fashioned VTR or something like that, which is driving the line with a, a transformer output stage, well, it does nothing. The transformer doesn't really care, and, and the whole signal is now developed across the whole coil because the midpoint of the coil has been shorted to the low end of the coil, uh, and that, that's fine. Sorry, the whole signal is now derived across half the coil. So you get no that's, loss yeah. of signal across the coil, but, but you get um, uh, full level out. Uh, mm -hmm. And... Maybe the transformer runs half a degree warmer, you know, because you're, you're, you're shorted out one side of the winding. It doesn't really matter. Doesn't that matter. was the way it was always done, uh, and, and that was kind of the, a BBC thing. People would kind of say, you know, that's, that's the way that it's done. However, in the 90s, you started to get equipment that had op-amp-driven outputs. Of course. Um, and, uh, you know, typically um, Avitel audio DAs. Uh, yes, you know, which were installed in their millions throughout television and and and, and post production facilities, and uh, I walked, I, I, I built one facility, and uh, we were using the same model of Avitel DAs to feed all the balance feeds around the place, but also to feed things like the VHS dub bank and things like that, and and so we just went ahead and did the usual thing of of, of shorting the ground to the um, uh, cold side of the signal at the back of the VHS dub bank, and. About six months into this new facility, I started to get getting DA, DAs failing because their output stages, the op-amps, were, were burning out. And uh, it is the case that if you don't have a transformer-driven output stage, you run the risk of burning out that op-amp because an op-amp, a bit of silicon sitting there running a few degrees hotter than it should for a few months at a time, um, you know, is a risk. And so I always yeah. tell Wyman now, no, 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 cut back the black at the phono and just use the screen and the earth, uh, screen and the hot. And although we lose 6 dBs, that probably doesn't matter because it's probably going into a DVD record or something, you know. Um, 
and some wiremen resist this, and they'll just do what you tell them not to do. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but um, you, you know, cut back the black. Uh, you know, that's what that's what I say to them. That you know, that's the only safe way of of going about this. Because otherwise, you're you're effectively grounding the output of a of a transistor, um, and some of them don't like that. Yeah, you know, silicon just eats. It. I mean, I, I bet most of these DAs, you know, you look inside, it's a seven four one or something like that. You know, yeah, it, it's just an off the shelf general purpose op amp, and they and they set the bandwidth gain product accordingly. It's just a unity yeah. gain buffer, isn't it? In essence. Yes. Um, so the next thing that's caught me out of the poo a couple of times is using a spare channel on a digital audio mixer as a noise gate for talkback. Oh, um, explain that. So there's been a couple of times when I've worked in small studios where we've had to rig up uh, talkback so that perhaps not the, not the regular presenter who's used to dealing with an in-ear and all that kind of stuff, but, but somebody who's an amateur uh, you know, or a pundit or something like that, and they've got to listen to the in ear from the from the gallery and other things while they're while they're delivering a piece of camera while they're talking, and uh, so 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 what I've done in those situations is I've used a spare channel on a, on a Yamaha O one V O two R or O three D or whatever, uh, and 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 used a compressor limiter hard set to to limit anything below you know uh, say twenty dBs to be silent. Mm -hmm. So unless the mic is unless the director has actually leaned into the mic and is talking, you know, production talkback. Um, the, 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 the person just hears silence in their ears, they don't hear the noise of the gallery, they don't hear, um, you know, the noise of ISDN lines coming up and going down or phone lines or whatever. Uh, and 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 that's kind of worked quite well. I, I did that at a um, at, at a, a college studio, uh, in the middle of town and also for a, a football club's little studio. And uh, you know, there's it's that, that kind of rule amongst OB people that you don't mix. Uh, audio with talkback but just on a couple of occasions you know it's, it's kind of suited me well to mm -hmm. use an extra compressor inside the mixer as a way of quietening down a talkback feed that's going back to somebody's in-ear so, so they're, they're not, not getting all the studio chatter they're just uh, they can concentrate on when they're being told something but yes so. yeah so when, when, when the so, director so. leans into the mic and talks you know the gate opens and they hear it uh, and you've got to be a little bit careful where you set it so that it's not so that they don't miss the first word, but this uh, is a squelch control by any other name. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you're in RF terms, yeah, you're, you're squelching down the noise of the gallery, which uh, you know, proper TV presenters are very used to hearing all that in their ears, yeah. aren't they? They're very used to hearing the lighting directors shouting at the racks engineer. Camera two's <laughs> a bit blue in the whites, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, that, that so that works very nicely for, uh, for in those sort of scenarios. That's a pretty clever thought. Never thought of that. What do you got next? <laughs> so, uh, passive volume controls using log, ah, log B yes. potentiometers. So, if I, uh, if I, I've got lots of photos here of, of previous things I've built. So, these are just little sort of typical kind of little switching boxes with um, a little control panel for the desk. Um, you know, so that uh, you know you've got just what you want. And nowadays, there are a lot more in the way of. Uh, you know, sort of pre-made. There's this one called the Big Knob, which <laughs> the Big Knob, the Mackie yeah, Big Knob. Yeah, yes. yeah. Which um, uh, a cheeky bit of marketing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, but if all you need to do is take a line level signal and and apply a volume control to it before you send it off to some powered speakers, mm -hmm. a log B potentiometer is just the thing. Uh, uh, with 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 the whole signal applied across the the track, and then your output taken from one side of the track and the wiper. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a, a, a beautiful um, solution to, a, to if you just want to make some volume adjustments. Um, I've done that more times than I, than I care to imagine. Um, there's, there's a typical example of the little wooden wedge that, that, that we, we do. We, we, uh, we've got a carpenter man who makes those up for us and uh, always does a very nice job. That's, that's, oh, yes. the, that's the raw material and uh, that's what you get. And, uh, and, and there's another variation on a theme. And yeah. in fact, uh, I get our friends at Bryant Broadcast do, do all the metal work and they... They uh, they do the sort of like nice engraving and hole cutting and all that kind of stuff because I'm I'm too lazy or I'm too I'm too cack handed to do a nice job of that <laughs> so I just send all the specs off to uh, to the metalwork guys at Bryant and uh, and that's what sort of, sort of thing I get back but yeah log B potentiometer um uh, you know suits you just 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 does the business um, very nice uh, and and the reason for that is that the 10k track doesn't load uh, the output of the um, uh, of the sending piece of equipment because it's a it's it's a high impedance as far as the sending piece of, of equipment goes, and to the receiving piece of equipment, 
uh, it looks like the 10k sending impedance that that, that originally sent that it was me. expecting. You yeah. know, so, so so it doesn't really upset anything. It's rather rather splendid. So here's Great. here's the next top tip, um, uh, or rather, it's a thing to be aware of because uh, it's bitten me on the backside. Um, RF cameras. Uh, so 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 here's a photo from. Let's see if I've got a better quality version of this photo. It's a photo from um, the FA Cup final at Arsenal last year, uh, and um, there we go. Uh, and, and so there's. I was I was working on the um, the live screens feed, and in fact we hired the two of the biggest at the time. I think at the time they were the biggest um, uh, 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 LED screens in Europe. Um, wow, and we, we, had four, we had four of them to uh, to entertain the fans who were all paid to come and see the final at uh, at the mm -hmm. stadium, and uh, and so uh, the way uh, we, we we did it was we had uh, uh, a roving camera going round the stadium, uh, talking to people. You know, what do you, what do you think of that goal kind of thing? And mm -hmm. and they were sort of cutting them up on the big screens, and and, and there was a you know PA and all that kind of stuff. But of course they were using an RF camera, uh, which um, you know has a I think a thirty eight um, megabit um, uh, link back to the OB truck and so you have an antenna sort of positioned at one of the tunnels in the stadium and so long as you're within 100 meters of that you can get the signals back to the, the truck uh, but the problem is being an RF camera it's got an MPEG-2 encoder inside and so it's a long op encoder because you want to get the best mm -hmm. bangs for your buck out of that um, 38 megabits per second because it's 1.5 gigabits per second that you're compressing uh, and, yeah. and so there is by its nature a, tw uh, uh, a 12 frame delay through the, through the chain Yes, now, of course. And, and, and so if you rely on the OB to uh, give you the audio feed back to the PA people who are sitting in the middle of the stadium driving the big speakers uh, so that the crowd can hear what's going on, uh, 12 frames of delay is quite distracting. Now, hmm. a proper presenter can just about talk against himself, hearing himself back 12 frames later. But uh, little Johnny, who's nine years old, who's come to the football with his dad, he definitely can't. Uh, and it's so really you, hard, you find yeah. that you know you you you, put, you give a microphone to somebody and you say what do you think of that last goal, and they start talking. They hear themselves coming back half a second later. Yeah, you know, they just clam Stop. up. Clam and, up or slur. I mean, it's it's very hard to do. Yeah, it's impossible. And so, um, uh, uh, I you know, OB Sound supervisors often despair at them because this one OB Sound supervisor was adamant that it was more to do with the length of cables. And I did a quick back of the envelope <laughs> calculation and I said. I said, do you know how long a cable you'd need to get half a second of delay? <laughs> it's it's like, you know, 78,000 miles. You know, it's, it's, it's a piece of cable that we don't have. Um, I can guarantee that the delay is because of the delay through the camera chain and the fact you're de-embedding it at the OB truck and giving it back to us. And so uh, uh, essentially we just, we just wound up taking a long XLR out the back of the camera. So, so the, the two microphones, the talent and the, and the mic on top of the camera, a little mix of that's coming out the back of the camera on an XLR and we took that to the PA and that kind of got us out of trouble. But, um, you know, I had to really kind of um, insist that that's what we tried before anybody would believe it. And uh, kind of horrified that they would imagine that... Um, uh, you, know, you could get that kind of delay out of a piece of cable. You, you know. <laughs> Perhaps it was because you used a very thin cable and it took longer for the sound to go through. Yeah, the electrons were slowed down somewhat. <laughs> oh, lovely. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Well, some fantastic tips there. Is that the last tip? I think That's my, my last tip, yeah. Um, yes. Oh, in fact, no, actually, I've, I have got one more top tip, oh. and it's just kind of one that's cropped up today. So if I, if I uh, take my camera up on the screen here... Uh, and um, and I lift this up without hopefully pulling any cables out. Uh, oh, bang, right, microphone. Yes. So this is a little Yamaha, what is this? This is an AG03 mixer. Um, and it's a recent acquisition, and then like 150 quid. Uh, and, and this replaces about four different bits of kit I used to previously use for recording these little things. Uh, this is, it's just a little uh, three-channel, so no, sort of five-channel mixer, I suppose. It's got a, a microphone input, um, of, of quite good quality. Uh, it's got a, a high impedance guitar input, so you can see where it's aimed at. It's aimed at bedroom yeah, musicians. Yeah. And it's got a, a line, a stereo line input, which you know actually on the top of the mixer is marked uh, with a little keyboard symbol, so clearly, aimed, again, aimed at bedroom musicians. Uh, but it's got just, uh, and there's, there's a phantom power supply in here, so my, my, my condenser mic uh, doesn't need a, a phantom power supply. And it's also a USB sound device. So it's plugged into my uh, laptop over USB and appears as a sound card. And if the specs are to be believed, it's 24-bit, 192 kilohertz, which you know, is good enough quality, you know. Oh, yeah. And 
it's got a few features. It's got a uh, there's a, comp a compressor uh, and equalizer built into it, and a little effects box. In fact, if I if I tab through, we can look at the bit of software that drives all that. So um, you can see uh, you know uh, levels are bouncing, uh, and uh, and this is channel one, which is I've got currently set for a a vocal male condenser mic, which is exactly what we've got here. Channel two's got a bunch of presets. And again, they're all guitar type sort of presets. Mm -hmm. And there's a little guitar simulator. They, because they do this cheesy thing of making it look like a, 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 <laughs> oh, yes, know, a Fender Twin or whatever. Oh, I've turned it on. You can hear the uh, you can you can hear the buzz of the guitar. <laughs> around here. Well, I was on stage for a moment there. Um, and then uh, so, so on the uh, on on the um, uh, you know, actual control panel itself. You can turn the compressor on and off. So if I if I if I press the button there, I don't know if you notice the difference there. I've, I've turned my compressor off. Uh, turn it back on again for that for that big bottom, that lovely deep big bottom sound. And um, if I turn the effects unit on, uh, you should be able to hear that. That's uh, well, well I'm, what, what, what's the effects unit set to? Uh, supposedly, I'm in a, I'm on stage. Yeah. that's rather okay. good, isn't it? I'll turn that off because I can get annoying quickly. Um, but uh, uh, staggering, you know, you, you get kind of all this audio processing for a hundred and something quid. Uh, but the really nice thing about it is that the that the uh, USB sound device in and out, which is how you're hearing Hugh. Um, Hello, this is yeah. Hugh talking through a USB sound device. Uh, uh, that that comes up on a proper pot, and uh, oh. and so that can be in the mix. And uh, uh, and in fact, the way you're hearing uh, um, me coming back. Uh, onto the recording is obviously the output of this thing as a sound device. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it, there, there, there's a little switch that allows you to use it without what he calls the loopback, without without that USB path coming in and out, which mm -hmm. you know you might might be useful. Uh, but it's also got proper monitoring, so I can say I only want to listen to, uh, um, you know, the 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 uh, non microphone channels. So it's that whole sort of thing of uh, uh, you know a mix minus, if you will. You know, I don't want to have to listen to my voice while while we're recording. I just want to be yep. able to hear. But if I release that monitoring button, I do hear my voice. I hear the whole mix because I want to be able to set the levels so so that we're getting a proper, uh, you know, nice level recording. So um, it's uh, you know it's it it, it uh, for me this is replaced as I say sort of four boxes a, a, a microphone phantom power box, uh, an audio mixer. Uh, and a couple of um, external sound devices that I would have used previously. So just quite handy for an edit suite, actually, for for a small edit suite. Yes, because people quite often want to do gash audio uh, uh, voiceovers. Um, yeah. And just to be able to plug a USB device into the workstation if it's local to your edit suite, that's super useful as well. And um, because it's a high quality sound card as well, uh, and you could do all the monitoring for a modest little edit suite very easily in this. So. I'm a big fan of this, and I suspect I suspect my kids are going to nick it because uh, because they're kind of musicians, they're guitar players and, and such, and, and so it's useful for that. My my youngest boy is doing music tech as an A level, and my middle boy does quite a lot of rocking and rolling. So um, I suspect uh, it might not stay in the workshop for too long. But for the minute, this is my podcasting rig in one tiny little box. I'm super impressed with it. Oh, that's brilliant! <laughs> well, some fab tips there, really useful stuff, um, and they'll get you out of jail cards. And Stuff to keep in it, what's in Phil's um, toolbox at uh, that uh, that little AJA box has obviously made its home nestled yeah. in the corner of your <laughs> that's, <laughs> what's in that's, Phil's bag. Or... That's right. Yeah. If you if you remember when we did that little um, you know what's in your toolbox um, oh what what's in your rucksack uh, podcast in your rucksack that's the yeah so they definitely uh, you know, it's not it's not yeah I always have one about you know ah oh, brilliant. So that's fantastic. Thank you, Phil. And uh, it's obviously much warmer in London than it is down in, in Gloucestershire. Uh, I, I was saying to Phil before we started that I'd forgotten to turn the heating on in the office, which is why I'm wrapped up warm. It's absolutely <laughs> perishing down here. Well, in fairness, I, I, did, I did run the heating in the workshop for about a, a half an hour before we started. But I noticed that with the compressor turned on on my little mixer, the microphone was really picking up the sound of the, uh, of the heater. So I, oh, right, I'm okay. just starting to shiver now. Just starting to shiver. Well, thank you, Phil. It's been a really good one. And I uh, look forward to doing the next one. Indeed. Before, before too much longer. So yes, we'll we see. won't be quite so tardy next time, I think. We'll try not to be. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> bye, bye. Good. See you soon.